Welcome to an introduction to UML. My name is uh, Dave Butler, and I'm a safety engineer at Exida. And prior to Exida, I have um, product development experience in, in various industries, including process control, product development, um, focused mostly on software and systems engineering. So I'm going to uh, spend some time today talking about um, UML. I'd like to give you just an introduction to some of the ideas inside of UML. I'll, I'll talk about some supporting concepts, and I'll talk about these uh, standardized specification um, for UML, the notation elements that are inside that specification. And I will talk about a lot of the different diagram types, which um, are also specified in that specification. Uh, the purpose of this introduction um, hour or so, oh, and by the way, um, I have run through this set of slides before, and it often takes me longer than an hour, so I'll, I'll warn you ahead of time. Uh, we usually try to stick to an hour for webinars. However, uh, since this is a recorded webinar, I felt it was okay to, uh, to go a little bit longer since you'll have control over, um, you know, skipping topics and that kind of stuff. Um, the introduction to UML um, is intended to lend perspective about what UML is and is not. Uh, to introduce some notation that you can use to uh, present design ideas, analysis ideas, so forth, um, for development, pretty much, although you can use UML for other purposes, um, and also to provide you uh, resources to further your understanding after this uh, introduction is over. So what is UML? UML is a standard modeling notation. Uh, it's defined by the UML specification, as I alluded to earlier, uh, which is um, managed by the omg.org organization. Uh, UML is extensible um, to the users, to, to the person using UML. Uh, and there's mechanisms for that. Um, mostly stereotyping is what I'm talking about, uh, and we'll cover some of that. And what is UML not? UML is not a workflow or methodology. And it's also not a modeling tool. Um, so various tools can represent UML slightly differently. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit of leeway in terms of how things are represented. And uh, again, we'll discover some of that as we move on here. I included this slide just to show you that, that uh, early on there was a, a large number of different uh, approaches to how to document more formally uh, designs, especially in software. Um, most of this is is focused on software. UML has emerged as sort of the standard way of, or a standard way of doing that. And um, the point should be made that it, it can be used for more than just software. So how do you use UML to diagram or model? Um, pretty much any way you can draw something, you can use UML. Um, UML is basically uh, graphical and textual in nature uh, with attached semantics for what the uh, symbols that you're using mean. Um, so you can use pencil and paper, you could use uh, a paint program, or you might use a specialized modeling software tool, um, which can get expensive. I mean, there, there are fairly sophisticated ones out there that do quite a bit, uh, Rational Rose and, and uh, Rhapsody um, being two of them. Software uh, development origins I, I mentioned before. I won't repeat myself there. Diagramming versus modeling. What's the difference? Um, diagramming is where the elements that you're um, using to represent design notation uh, are basically part of the diagram and are not stored anywhere else. So the diagram is the entire data set for the thing that you're representing. You get multiple diagrams in a in this set, but if they re if each diagram represents the same item uh, in different ways or even in the same way, you're repeating that uh, notation on the different diagram, so it's stored in two different places. And uh, I'll show you uh, a picture in a few seconds that will explain that a little bit better. Um, basically, you're just using formatted shapes like Visio shapes on uh, on a page. Modeling, on the other hand, uh, has sort of metadata behind the diagrams. And the actual things you're representing, like classes and actions and interfaces and uh, components, uh, are all captured in, in data, in a database, and not presented at all 
Um, and then you can have a view of those stored um, representations on a page, and a tool would do something like that. So uh, the way I've listed this here is with Model View Controller. Model View Controller is a, a design pattern in the software that basically says the data is in a model. The views are how you represent the data on the screen. So you can represent the same model data in two different views, and it's non-redundantly stored, and yet you're seeing different representations on different screens, so that if you change one screen, you will see it on another one. The controller is just basically uh, the rules and the actual tool that um, you know control rendering the model into the view. So uh, this is sort of pictorially what, what I've just described. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, there's a modeling scenario where the LM or element um, boxes on the lower part of the uh, repository um, area there is um, a representation of the data stored in uh, the modeling repository where they're not actually seen on the screen. At the top of the diagram is diagram one and diagram two. Those represent the view portion of it, and Visio is in the middle to render the data in the modeling area onto a page. You have the same sort of thing over in um, a diagramming scenario, but the shape data is actually self-contained within each diagram. So if the upper left-hand corner um, of diagram one, that shape is also the upper left-hand corner of diagram two, you can see that that shape is stored in two separate places, whereas in the modeling scenario, one of those LM boxes would be basically what the, is represented by the shape in the diagram. So what is UML used for? Uh, it can be used for a lot of different things. It can be used for uh, use case analysis, which is um, part of analyzing and, and exploring requirements uh, and capturing requirements. Uh, use case analysis uh, captures a lot of the uh, mostly behavioral requirements, um, functional requirements. System architecture design um, can be rendered in UML, but there's also another extension to UML, which is another standard called SysML, uh, which uh, extends the capabilities of UML into, into different areas, uh, mostly oriented towards system design, and that's called SysML. Uh, product hardware, software, architecture design, so you can represent hardware and software on the same diagram or, or just hardware or just software to show the internals of how something is designed. Uh, and software detail design, of course, so you can actually model all the way down to single lines of code. Um, and in fact, a lot of these modeling tools, um, which I'll show you on the next screen here, um, some of them are capable of actually generating software code um, from the models. And uh, I've actually worked on a project like that, and it's, it's, uh, it works pretty well. I used uh, iLogic's Rhapsody. Um, iLogic's was purchased by Telelogic, which was in turn purchased by IBM. IBM also owns Rational Rose, uh, so there are two, I suppose, competing products um, that do the same thing with respect to UML modeling. Um, the Rational set of, of tools is a whole suite. Um, Altova is another product. It's a, sort of a cheaper desktop product. Um, I have not actually tried that one. Visio has UML capabilities uh, and can both diagram and model. Um, in order to model, you would have to create a, a UML page to start with. Star UML is an open source free um, UML tool. However, it hasn't been maintained since about uh, 2005 as a project, so it's going to lag very far behind the current UML standards. However, if you wanted to just get your feet wet, that might be a way to go. I would prefer um, to, to send you to Visio if you have that. Um, and then many other tools uh, can also be found in um, these two lists that I've uh, included links to. Uh, in addition to that, the UML reference, the, the actual specification of the UML, or Unified Modeling Language itself, is um, can be found in some of these references, mostly the top reference there. So that might help you in your studies. Okay, supporting concepts. So I'd like to go over a few um, concepts that are, are sort of, um, they're not really notations per se, they're just sort of ideas about um, how the uh, OMG organization has written up the um, specification for UML. 
Uh, the specification has something in it called a meta class. Um, so there's a lot of elements, uh, and, and this slide right here is about elements. Um, UML calls pretty much anything you can plunk down on a page an, an element. Um, so you, you might have a class or uh, an action or uh, an association. Any of those are elements that you can kind of plunk down. Each element has um, the ability to have a name, attributes, uh, a stereotype specification. Um, you can tag them for uh, grouping and searching kinds of purposes. Uh, there's a bunch of different metadata that goes with each meta class. Um, and then they're further subdivided um, beyond that into classifiers, events, and behaviors. Um, a classifier is basically uh, a type of object. It's sort of a static model of something. And we'll get into those. Uh, I'll show you examples of all these. Um, not so much the events. Um, an event is basically an occurrence of something, and so it's, it's sort of a generic description of an occurrence of, of a type of event. So a timer tick might be an event, but you might have different, kind, different instances of timer ticks in your, in your design. Uh, a message receipt is a kind of event, and you might, ha again, have different kinds of message receipts, um, message receipt events in your uh, design. Uh, an error, same, same kind of thing. And then a behavior is uh, a set of um, steps, basically. It's a set, think of it as, if you think of a uh, function in, um, in programming, you might have a set of statements that execute. Um, that set of statements is, uh, could be a behavior, or a whole function could be a behavior, including the parameterization of that function. Um, classifiers, events, and, and behaviors model objects, occurrences, and executions. So uh, a classifier models an instance of a classifier, which is another word for that would be an object. Um, an event um, represents an instance uh, I'm sorry, an occurrence represents an instance of an event, and an execution represents an instance of a behavior. A little bit esoteric, but um, ideas that once you've used this for a while, you go back and look at them and go, oh, I see what they mean. Um, so I just wanted to put them on a piece of paper and, and show them to you. Stereotypes. Stereotypes are a mechanism to extend the meaning of UML, standard UML notation. So um, any element can be stereotyped, um, and it basically, as I said, extends the standard semantics uh, specified in the UML uh, standard, and um, can, they can be used for many different purposes. Mostly they're used for human understanding, but tools can also use uh, specialized stereotypes to indicate how the tool is to be is to use the um, stereotyped element, what it's supposed to do. So, for example, you could uh, stereotype something as a DLL, and it might create a DLL for you when you do code generation. Um, usually, they're they're used for just human understanding, though. Uh, a standard stereotype in UML is a uh, a lollipop representation of an interface. So it, you can have an abstract class, um, and that represents a contract between two communicating parties. And then you can represent that as, as a, a lolly, lollipop um, in the lollipop notation. Uh, we'll get more into that. The, the stereotype portion of that, though, is to, is to use a class to represent an abstract contract between two communicating parties. And that um, further constrains a class uh, to be sort of a specialized use of a, a class. And that's what stereotypes are for, is to sort of uh, call out what the use of that uh, object is. Um, so user-defined stereotypes, you might have, I have a couple of examples here. You might have a, an association between uh, two classes. Uh, an association is usually rendered as some kind of a line. And then you stereotype that as TCP IP, indicating that it's not just communication between the classes, it's this specific kind of communication, TCP IP communication between these classes. Um, you might stereotype a box as a Windows PC or a software component as a DLL. So there's many kinds of UML diagrams, um, class diagram, sequence diagram, state machine diagram, and so on. Um, each diagram has its own notation, has its own semantics, and is constrained in certain ways. Um, 
the uh, a diagram may include symbols on it, symbol types on it, or element types on it, that are also able to be included in other diagram types. And it may have some symbols which are only used on that diagram type. So um, there's just rules about, about what kinds of elements go on what kinds of um, diagrams. Package, the packaging concept is basically you can create something called a package, which has its own notation. Uh, the package is basically just a named container for model elements to be stored in. So if you think of a, the, the model, if you think about back to that picture where I had a repository and with all the elements and diagrams in it, think of that as sort of a tree structure, um, kind of like a file, uh, file system might be. Uh, you can have a hierarchical set of these packages that contain different modeling elements. So they may be rendered in a tool, for example, in some kind of a frame to the left. And then to your right, and this is the way it's done in Visio, uh, to your right, you might have a, a, a diagram page. And then you can pull from your tree and place uh, elements onto uh, the diagram. So they're stored in the um, packaging tree, if you will. And then you can pull those out and... and plunk those onto your diagrams. Okay, that's it for the common concepts. Um, so now what I'd like to do is actually talk about the notation, the um, UML notation, the elements in, in UML. So I'm going to show you some things that are sort of design, or, or I'm sorry, diagram snippets. So here you can see that there's uh, four boxes connected by some lines. Um, that might be included on a diagram. This is not a diagram in itself. Um, uh, but sort of meant to show what a class is. A class is sort of a workhorse of UML and represents a static um, object type, if you will. So, for example, if your application, you're writing a software application, let's say, that's, that wants to simulate mousetraps, maybe it's a gaming application, um, you might have a, a mousetrap class, and then you want to model what's, what about that mousetrap, you know, what are the uh, properties of that mousetrap. So you would uh, be able to model how the mousetrap uh, works and is through attributes, operations, and receptions. And there's uh, generally three different compartments. There should be a line between the operations and the receptions. But um, basically, the three different compartments hold uh, attributes, which represent sort of methods. I'm sorry, not methods. Members or properties. Uh, attributes, those are all sort of synonymous uh, ways of thinking about the properties of this um, mousetrap, but attributes is the name that uh, UML uses. And each attribute has its own properties, and we can talk about those in a minute. Uh, an operation is sort of like a function call, a method, um, something like that. This is, you can tell this is sort of object-oriented. Um, and a reception is um, sort of an event handler that takes a, a signal or um, some kind of an event uh, to trigger it. Um, notice on the right, there is a base and a spring attribute as well. Uh, and I'll talk about the uh, association with the black diamond there, but basically what that's showing is that the wood block, there's a wood block uh, class that represents a base member of the mousetrap. So that word base could be added to the list of attributes in the attributes compartment of the class, or you can represent it as a separate class connected by that uh, association line and labeled with the word base. So two different ways to represent um, members or attributes. So each, each attribute um, has a name. It has a type, which might be a class. Um, it has a multiplicity, so if you have an array of um, members, that's the way you would represent that. It has visibility, which says whether it's public or private. Um, it also can have initial values, and, and there's several other traits that are defined by UML. So a class is a type, as I've said before, uh, that represents a collection of, of different kinds of instances of that type. So you might have an automobile class that has a make, model, and engine size, a start, stop, and accelerate function or operation. And you might instantiate that class to create an actual instance of a car, or at least a modeled car. So in this case, I've created an instance. The instance's name is called Dave's Car, 
and the colon automobile uh, relates it back to the automobile class. So the automobile on the right is the class name. Um, and then the values for make, model, and engine size are all specified on this particular diagram or in this particular instance. Interfaces, as I said before, are um, contracts between a provider and a uh, user. And uh, the, the example I have here is a theft alarm that interfaces, uh, inter interfaces to a proximity sensor um, through an eye sensor interface. The eye sensor interface is labeled in the middle box uh, and it's stereotyped as an interface and has two functions, activate and read. The triangular box on the right indicates that the proximity sensor is providing that interface and the dependency association on the left, the dotted line with the open arrow, indicates that uh, that is a user of the interface. Uh, and there are other ways to represent that, as I mentioned before, the uh, lollipop notation, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, interfaces can have uh, attributes, operations, and receptors, or receptions rather, just like uh, any class can. An interface is an, what's called an abstract class, and it cannot be instantiated per se. It just indicates that these two things are talking to each other in a certain way, using a certain protocol. Um, interface realization. Okay, what is interface realization? Um, realization means that the um, object or the, the class um, realizing that interface um, implements the logic inside of it to provide the interface's um, function. So basically, on the left, you'll see theft alarm and proximity sensor again. And the proximity sensor realizes the eye sensor interface. So it has code in it to implement, activate, and read functions. Theft alarm can then come along and call those activate and read functions. Um, this slide shows the three, shows three different ways you can represent um, the interface idea. Uh, so the one on the left uses what's called a generalization um, notation. The one on the upper middle uses the lollipop notation, and the one in the lower right uses something called a ball and socket notation. Uh, the first two have classes interfacing to each other. The third example has two components, which are not classes, uh, interfacing to each other uh, through this ball and socket notation. And we'll talk more about components later. Objects. Objects are basically instances of classes, as I've mentioned before. Uh, you underline the name. The type name may or may not be displayed. The object name or the instance name may or may not be displayed. And attributes take on specific values, as we saw in our previous uh, slide that had the equal signs in it. The instance basically has state, has real state. It has real, um, if you look at the progression of a program as it runs, the state of that instance may change over time, depending on what functions are called on it and what it does to itself. So here's uh, some examples of how to render um, an object in UML, or how to, how to draw or present an object in UML. On the left, you see the automobile class. That is not an instance. The other four boxes you see on the right are all the same instance. They represent the same exact instance, Dave's car, which is an automobile and has a make, model, and engine size of Nissan, Altima, and 245 horsepower. Um, you can see all the names are underlined. In some cases, you have Dave's car as part of the name. In some cases, you don't. The uppercase D in the lower right-hand corner is a mistake. That should actually be a lowercase D. Um, you can see that you don't even need the instance name of the um, instance on the um, rendering of that instance or the, the presentation of that instance. And you can get it all the way down to just the instance name with a box around it. That's uh, sort of a minimal representation. These different representations, the reason for them is so that you can, your diagrams can be uh, drawn in different ways depending on the context of what you're trying to show in your design. So in this case, in the case of a Dave's car with just the name and the box around it, maybe you want to include that on a diagram that has all kinds of instances on it just to show that they're relationships to each other.
but you really don't care about the specific make, model, and engine size of each one, and you really don't care that they're all of automobile class because it's sort of implicit. You know that already. So that's one way to compress down how much real estate you use on a diagram and is a good reason for why you would want to render that or present that um, notation in sort of a compact format. Okay, associations. Associations are relationships between two elements, and there's many, many kinds for many, many different purposes. Almost all diagrams have relationships like this on them. Um, not all the, not all associations are, are on all diagram types, but um, they all have associations in general. So an association in general has uh, named ends, or can have named ends. Um, it can have a direction. You can have a single arrow, or you can have a bi-directional navigation, which is indicated by no arrow. And um, a source of an arrow has a reference to the destination object. So uh, the single arrow actually means that the place where the arrow is coming from is keeping track of what the other thing is somehow. And it depends on the type of association and how it keeps track. It also depends on the implementation of you know, code generation or if you're just drawing for um, educational purposes. Um, each association can have <coughs> a stereotype. So even though you, we saw this before with the um, generalization association, the open triangle uh, for realizes. The realizes uh, stereotype was present on that example. It can have a multiplicity, meaning that the end of the arrow might have m multiple objects of that type. So you might have a single um, instance of a class which points to another instance of a class, and that instance of a class might be actually three or more instances. Maybe it's representing an array of instances of something. Um, and you could have visibility indicated at each end as well. So um, there might be a minus sign, which means private, a plus sign, which means public, or a pound sign, which means protected. OK, so these are some examples of common associations. Uh, the first one is a bidirectional association or a nonspecific association. Uh, a lot of times you just draw a line to show you know, these two things are related. And you really don't care about the fact that it's bidirectional. You're really not paying attention to the fact that one has a reference to the other and so forth. You're just trying to show sort of a general high-level idea. That's allowed. Um, when it gets down to the specific semantics, if you're going to generate a program, then you would care about the um, bidirectional nature of the of the line. Uh, dependency, I talked about dependency before, but basically the uh, left end of the arrow depends on the thing at the right end of the arrow. Generalization is basically can is sort of you can read this line as sort of a generalization line or a specialization line depending on where your focus is. So the left end of the arrow is a general generalization of whatever is at the right end of the arrow. So for example, if you have a, a Nissan car on the right-hand side and an automobile on the left-hand side, an automobile is a generalization of a specific kind of automobile. Um, and in, in the case of classes, the automobile class would generalize a Nissan automobile class, where Nissan automobile is one name. Uh, and represents a, a more specialized class. So you could say that the Nissan automobile specializes on the class automobile. So you can read it in both directions. Um, you can also look at um, this as a realizes uh, implementation. I'm sorry, realizes notation as well, which uh, we've covered before. Um, the next one is the diamond. The a diamond indicates aggregation, and there's two types of aggregation. There's shared aggregation and composite aggregation. And I'll talk some more about those in a future slide. And finally, this shows a stereotyping of a, an association where you have uh, some kind of communication between two process control objects, uh, in this case, uh, communicating through 4 to 20 milliamp signal. OK, so here's two classes. These classes are associated through a binary association or a nonspecific association, whichever you choose. Um, the one on the right um, is vehicle category, and the one on the left is classified vehicle. Those are the name ends. 
And then uh, this shows explicitly that the vehicle is related to a single vehicle type. You do not have to put the one there. If you don't put the one there, it's implied that it's there. So that's a way to simplify diagrams. And simplifying diagrams is an important part of UML. Okay, the next one is an, uh, a dependency association. A dependency association simply shows that one uh, element is dependent on another element. So in this case, a, a car factory instantiates a car. So a car factory needs to know about cars. It depends on the definition of a car. Um, and the car does not know anything about a car factory. It just knows about itself. It's a car. Uh, so again, stereotyping here is important to show that it's an instantiation relationship. Obviously, there's many other types of dependency relationships. Here's the example of a generalization association. It shows that uh, a polygon, ellipse, and a spline are all specializations of, of the general shape class. Um, so again, you can say they're specialized versions of shape, or you can say shape is a generalized version of a polygon, ellipse, and a spline. Uh, that relationship, by the way, is uh, used for inheritance. So in software, a shape might be a class which contains gener generic um, methods or properties that apply to all of the specialized versions of it. And then polygon, ellipse, and spline add to those methods or modify those methods and uh, properties to uh, come up with the specialized versions of the shapes. Shared aggregation association uh, is, again, one of the two types of aggregation associations. If the diamond is an open diamond, it represents shared aggregation and is a have a relationship. Aggregation is a have a relationship. Um, the open or closeness of the diamond simply means that, in this case, B would not be created when you create an A object. So if you use the A class to create an instance, a B instance is not automatically created. Um, what happens is there are methods in A or um, data is given through parameters of methods in A that allow you to add a B object to an A, and it becomes part of um, the A instance. So you might have an array list, or you might have a list of, of Bs and you want to give one of those Bs to an A object that you created. So you create the A object, and then you call a method to say add a B to A. And now it, now it has an aggregated uh, reference to B. Uh, composite aggregation works um, almost the same way, except that when you create, in this case, a mousetrap, the woodblock base the, the attribute base or the, the um, instance of a woodblock called base would automatically be created as part of the creation of mousetrap. So if you're familiar with software, there's a, a construction or constructor. Constructor would also create the base and the spring that are part of the mousetrap model. So in this case, composite aggregation indicates a must-have relationship. Events. Events um, are basically occurrences of interest at a specific time and location, and there's some kind of an arrival to uh, a reception of that event. Um, events can be broken down in UML to four different types of events, a call, a signal, a change, or a time event. Uh, and each event um, could have attributes of some sort. So it's not just the fact that something occurred, but there's also a communication of data. So for example, um, an asynchronous signal might be uh, sent from one process in software to another process. And as part of that communication of the event, the signal may have values associated with it. So for example, if it represents an error, it's an error signal, you might have the type of error that it was that indicates that not only is it an error, but it's also a certain kind of error. You can represent that in different ways. For example, you could have different um, events to represent the different types, or you could have just one event type that has a piece of data in it that represents the type of event that it is. 
components are basically a modular system part that encapsulate um, the contents of that um, part and that can be used to build up larger systems. Uh, you can deploy these into execution environments and each component has uh, certain uh, parts of it. Uh, so a name, ports, interfaces, and some kind of realization that, that is the body uh, of what it's supposed to do, its responsibilities and so forth. And uh, you can use connectors to connect components. That's, what, that's why the word connector is there. So here's an example of two components, uh, each one of which provides an interface. The top component uses the lower component's interface, and they must be connected through what's called an assembly connector that connects directly to ports. Uh, the little square boxes on the edges of the components, those represent something called ports. And um, a port is basically, uh, think of an example of a port might be a serial port or um, it could be any kind of port. Uh, it doesn't have to be a physical port, although generally physical ports are represented by ports. You can have logical ports as well. Ports support interfaces. However, components can also support interfaces without a port. Okay, actions. Uh, actions are basically fundamental elements of execution. Um, so lines of code, think of lines of code where there's an input process and outputs. Um, they're contained in behaviors, which is a general term in UML, um, that supply context. Again, it's sort of an abstract term, the term behavior. Uh, inputs, you can string actions together by uh, taking one action's outputs and passing it to another action's inputs. Um, so examples might be call operations, functions, methods, scripts, etc. Uh, send an action could send a signal, uh, and you can have direct behavior invocations. In other words, you don't need necessarily an, an interface. It could just be part of a UML um, element. So like a, um, a transition in a state transition diagram may have an action on it, which could be a function call. So think of a function call as a statement that calls a function, not the function itself. Um, so that's just a snippet of code. It could just be an assignment statement um, by itself. So you're not specifying a wrapper around that logic. You're just, you're just calling that um, code snippet or, or logic snippet an action. OK, activities. Um, kind of add to actions, they can uh, coordinate actions. Um, they can model multi-threaded behaviors um, and are used to, um, to provide other sort of uh, control and data flow elements to the overall idea. An activity diagram can have, um, can, can show an activity which has different regions, which are the different threads of execution. Thread is kind of a, a strong word to use there, but different um, asynchronous executions of the behaviors. Uh, events can occur external to the flow, uh, they, and they can be fed into uh, activities and control what happens inside the activity. Uh, and exceptions might be supported. We'll, we'll get into activity diagrams a little later. Um, but basically, just wanted to, to show you a little bit about uh, the idea of an activity element. So there's different kinds of activity elements. Uh, there's accept event actions, there's send signal actions, there's a general action. Um, uh, these are sort of um, items that would go on to an activity diagram. Uh, there's a data store. Decision would be like a diamond, like a flowchart kind of a, an act, um, element. Uh, a merge node, a fork node, a join node. Uh, initial node, and an object node. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in activity diagrams. OK, we've reached the point where we're going to start discussing diagrams. Um, there are two kinds of diagrams, structure diagrams and behavior diagrams. Structure diagrams are for representation of static design information, um, like uh, the members of a class, for example, or how two objects relate to each other. 
Um, so the different kinds of structure diagrams are package, class, composite structure, object, component, and deployment diagrams. There's sort of um, a description of how a system is designed. Then the behavior diagrams are how the design is used to do things. Um, so it might be a specification of a state machine inside the design that constrains the um, application being designed or the product being designed to be within a subset of states and describes exactly how those states specifies, how those states interact with each other and how they transition from one state to another, what causes them to transition and so on, and what they do when they transition. So um, behavior diagrams, uh, use case diagrams, sequence diagrams, communication diagrams, state machine diagrams, and activity diagrams. The last two I, I won't be discussing. They're fairly new diagrams. I'm not 100% sure what interaction overview diagrams are meant to show. I haven't studied them at all and have not used them. Timing diagrams are there to show timing between uh, various operations in a design. So you can show how many milliseconds something takes. You can uh, identify race conditions and things like that. OK, let's start to explore the structured diagrams. Uh, the first one will be uh, package diagrams. And you notice I've labeled it file system here because that's a good example or a good um, sort of analogy that you can keep in your mind. Um, about what package diagrams do for you. Uh, just to repeat what I've said before, um, package elements um, are contained in package diagrams. The elements can be nested, and dependencies can be shown between packages. So here's a good example uh, of that, or an example of that. Um, a lot of the diagrams that I'm going to show you with respect to diagramming are drawn by different kinds of tools. And they may look very different from each other, even though they represent the same things. But that's because tool manufacturers are allowed to, um, they're given, as I said earlier, they're given some leeway in terms of how they represent things. The uh, file folder idea is always represented, but maybe it's yellow in one, maybe it's not in another. Maybe you can have these icons here that represent folders um, in addition to the actual uh, element, and so on. So as I said, the tools have a good deal of leeway between them. Uh, this is a package diagram that shows a deployment model of something. Uh, and it contains nodes, artifacts, and topology. You can see that listed in the upper left-hand corner, which you don't have to do. And also, the plus signs indicate that those are all public. Um, then each of those packages is, is illustrated with a larger uh, UML notation of a package. Um, nodes, artifacts are on the top portion and topologies on the bottom. The dotted lines show the how, how topology relates to artifacts, the artifacts package and the nodes package. So it looks like the topology uses the artifacts and nodes. Um, the nodes package contains a devices package and an execution environments package, which each in turn contain components uh, which are listed there. So you can sort of get the idea about how these are used in diagrams, or how they can be used in diagrams. Uh, lots of times, packages are illustrated um, in a tool-specific way and reduce the need for package diagrams. Um, OK, class diagram. Uh, the purpose of a class diagram is to show classes and their relationships. Um, so we started with the mousetrap before. I've sort of enhanced that diagram to show uh, a more to show more uh, features of UML on this one. You can see that in the middle is the mousetrap class. It's composed of a hammer holding bar, a catch state, uh, a catch and a state, a base and a spring. And then you can add to it, through the aggregation relationship, some bait. Uh, the bait could be peanut butter bait. It could be a cheese bait. And you can see that through the generalization relationship on the left three classes there. Um, when bait is taken by a mouse, a uh, signal is generated by something external to the mouse trap, probably the, the mouse model, whatever that is, and uh, that signal is sent to the mouse trap, which would then execute the bait taken reception um, operation and would probably call the snap uh, method, the snap operation. <coughs> 
On the right-hand side, you can see springs are also broken down into two kinds of springs, a, uh, one with a force index of 40 and one with a force index of 97. It's debatable about which one is humane and which one is deadly, but uh, I'll leave that for some other time. <laughs> um, okay, uh, composite structure diagrams. Composite structure diagrams, as this picture sort of alludes to, are meant to show how things are constructed, you know, what parts make up um, a larger entity. So here's an example of a composite structure diagram which uses aggregate, um, an aggregate association, or an aggregation association, and uh, three, or, yeah, three classes. So you have a car, you have two wheels, and you have an engine. The engine instance is labeled E, so that's the name of the instance of the engine. Uh, and then you have an axle between the engine and the wheels. Very simple model, obviously. Uh, doesn't really reflect reality, but for whatever purposes, uh, that's how it's been constructed. The Another way to represent uh, composition is this car class uh, contains two wheels, an axle, and an engine. And it shows you how they're related together. Now, the axle could be related, uh, could be represented by um, another type of association that has a class kind of hanging off of it. So if you wanted to model the axle more in a more sophisticated way, you could actually attach a class to the association um, and represent it that way. The dotted line represents the fact that the engine is something that is not part and parcel of a car when it's created. It's, it's added later. Um, it might have been more appropriate to make the wheels, something that are added later, because that's a little bit more realistic, maybe. But in this particular design, it's the engine that is um, added later. So maybe you're shipping a car kit where somebody can add their own engine, um, and so forth. So the dotted the dotted line corresponds to the uh, non-aggregated association in the left-hand picture. Okay, object diagrams. Object diagrams are, are meant to focus on instances of classes. Uh, however, you can put a class on an object diagram to show the instance's relationship to its, its class. Um, you use instance names, obviously, and show the relationship between, you can show relationships between objects, and you, wanna, you may want to show specific attribute values. So here's an example of an object diagram. Uh, you have a customer object you have three order objects on the bottom. So this particular customer's name is Jane Doe. It has her phone number there and an internal customer ID. And it shows that um, Jane Doe has three orders outstanding, or maybe just three orders associated with her. Uh, one for $500, one for $478, and one for $698. Um, so you can see that the instance values are assigned to the member uh, values in this example. Component diagrams. Okay, component diagrams are also uh, meant to show what makes up a larger part. However, they're meant to show um, something that you're specifically designing as a component, um, which is sort of a higher level than what we were showing before with the classes. So you identify components on diagrams like this. You can uh, show relationships between them. You can show internal and external components. Um, to show sort of scoping boundaries. Um, you can uh, show connections and types of connections uh, through plane associations or stereotype associations or specific kinds of associations. Um, and so you can show more detail and less detail through those types of associations. You can um, show connections between internal components and also between internal and external components. I suppose you could show relationships between external components as well. Uh, and the connections may or may not have ports, as I mentioned before. This is an example of, or, or I'm, sure, I'm sorry, this is uh, three different representations of how an interface might be uh, supported by uh, components. So the top example is a provided interface. This is one where name, the name component realizes the uh, lollipop interface, and there, there should be a name there actually to say what type of interface it is. Um, but it shows that it provides it or it implements that, that particular interface as we discussed before. 
the middle one is showing a required interface that says that the name object in the middle is going to be dependent on whatever provides that interface. And the one on the bottom shows an interface that is supported by a port. Um, and basically a port sort of further constrains uh, something about how the component provides that interface. In other words, it provides the interface, but only through a certain means, the port. This is uh, sort of a complex example of a component diagram, and you can see that the, um, there are several components inside. This is meant to be software components. Uh, the outer component is the policy admin component. Uh, you can see that at the top of the box where it's labeled, the application components colon colon is basically something called a namespace and more or less corresponds to a package. So there, there's probably somewhere in this application an application components package. And that application components package has uh, the policy admin component. It has the underwriting and rating engine component, the UI generator component, and so on. Uh, as part of it, uh, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, external to that uh, large component, you can see there's another package called infrastructure components, which contains uh, some of the components outside that um, policy admin component. You can also see that there's external interfaces provided through ports, such as the iPolicy service interface. You can see um, the dependency of uh, the iPolicy service interface on uh, the internal um, component called policy server that also provides the iPolicy server interface. So that's sort of a uh, mechanism called delegation, which is represented by that delegates or delegate um, stereotype. Uh, I don't need to get into any more of the specifics of this, but you can see that this could be uh, used to represent quite a number of different relationships in an overall architecture of um, a fairly large component which does many things. Okay, next diagram type is deployment diagrams. Purpose of deployment type or the purpose of deployment diagrams is to show how um, sort of an instance of deployment in a system. So there might be multiple boxes in a system, each which takes different software components. And there may, you may be able to mix and match software in a system, even though the hardware nodes in the system pretty much stay the same. Let's say you have an array of PCs, but depending on how you store software in those PCs, they may be a collection of you know, A-type servers or a collection of B-type servers, or maybe a mixture of A and B-type servers. And maybe all of those uh, configurations are um, valid and you want to represent different kinds of configurations. Maybe you want to show which ones are valid and which ones are not valid, what the appropriate way to mix and match is and, and so forth. Um, so deployment diagrams allow you to do that stuff. Um, on a deployment diagram, you would represent specific physical mo nodes, usually physical, talking through um, uh, associations between those nodes called links. Um, and as I said before, the system is usually configurable. Um, it might be configurable via interconnections between nodes. It might be configurable via uh, what's stored in a node. Um, there are things called um, deployment specifications that allow you to um, document how something is configured um, if the way you're configuring it is sort of a runtime kind of a configuration. Um, so examples of deployment diagrams might be uh, cloud communication via routers, bridges, switches, and you might want to show all that as, as the uh, sort of title page humorously. Uh, my attempt at humor in, in what a de massive deployment might look like. Um, LAN communications, um, you might have, um, as I said before, mix and match equipment, uh, talking through serial ports, parallel ports, TCP IP protocols, etc. All that stuff can be indicated on, on deployment diagrams. So what is a node? A node is generally a physical entity, and nodes can be containers for artifacts such as hardware, software, data components, um, and deployment specifications. 
uh, you can have nodes nested within nodes. So um, because they're physical and because they're connected with uh, links, a good example of that might be uh, where you have hardware components inside a computer. So you might have a video board which plugs into some kind of a bus that talks to the um, motherboard. So the motherboard might be a node, and the video board might be the node, a node, and the bus that it talks through uh, might be a link. Um, so, okay, I gave you some examples, I guess. Uh, ROMs might be, you know, you might, anything that's physical that talks through some kind of a known physical interface um, would be a candidate to be a node. And then the ports are the actual connectors, but not necessarily the links that are uh, on the node that allow it to talk through that, um, that mechanism. Uh, deployment descriptors, as I mentioned before, are sort of classes that are instantiated to uh, create a description of how something is deployed, how it exist at, exists in a system as deployed. So you can have sort of um, um, deployment specifications, and then you would have um, a descriptor, a deployment descriptor. So the descriptor is sort of an instance of that specification. The specification says what you have to describe in order to deploy it. An instance of that would be, uh, a descriptor would be um, how you have used those things to describe a specific deployment. Um, so examples of those might be configuration files or an XML file containing dependencies for an inversion um, application. Okay, here's another example of a uh, deployment diagram, um, or an example of a deployment diagram. And you can see there's the outer orange boxes are um, the nodes. The communication paths between them are specified. There's only four of them. And uh, the components inside the box are the yellow um, elements. They have uh, stereotypes, some of them are executable code. Um, I'm not sure what vendor means on the, on the quote server. Um, there's a configuration component on the top left in the client node. Um, and you can see that there's curly brace uh, statements in each of the components that uh, represent basically constraints on those components. So basically, they're just further describing the component, what language it uses to, for implementation, what version it is, and so forth. Here's another component diagram, uh, deployment diagram, sorry, um, that shows the relationships between nodes. Um, and you can see the outer node is the transmitter. Inside the transmitter, there's a sensor system, which might be a, 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 some kind of uh, electronic board module. Uh, there's a microprocessor module, and there's a current output system module, along with the user interface module, heart motor module, and so on. The power supply is shown, but it doesn't communicate with anything, so there's no links to it. There's also a watchdog that communicates with the microprocessor system through a um, through two ports, the WD port, or the watchdog port, and the reset port on the microprocessor side, and the trigger and shutdown ports on the watchdog side. Um, one further thing to notice is that the, there's ports on the outer transmitter node, and the output port is basically receiving signals from two different internal nodes, the heart modem and the output system. This is showing that um, there's two different kinds of signals going through the same node, which might mean that you have two interface lollipops on the outside of that thing. So I mean, if you know how uh, heart signals work, there's basically a signal that rides on top of another signal, and they're, um, the two signals are combined into one. It can be separated at the other side. Okay, here's a, this is just another example of a deployment diagram. I'm going to move along uh, just in the interest of time here. Um, behavior diagrams are next. Um, the behavior diagram... Uh, one type of behavior diagram is a use case diagram. This shows uh, different uses of a particular system and represents sort of functional steps. Each, each ellipse in there represents a use case. Uh, so there's a set timer use case. So a set timer might mean that a terrorist comes along and sets the timer, um, which uh, sets the time display 
And um, later on, as time marches on, time is updated inside the device once it's been enabled and so forth. Uh, kind of not a great example of, of use case diagram, but uh, you get the idea. The stick figures on the outside are called actors, and they basically uh, relate to the particular use cases. So this shows that the explode um, use case is not meant to interact with the terrorist um, actor, but can affect the bomb squad member and can affect the victim. So um, you, I think you get the idea here. A bomb, the only the only person that's going to come along and in, in this model uh, and then cut a red wire, blue wire, or green wire is going to be a bomb squad member. You know, a victim is not going to be able to do that in this particular model. Uh, you could make a, a victim be able to do that, um, but then you would model it differently. Oh, actually, one, one further thing is to notice that, that there are extends and uses relationships between use cases. And I don't want to get too far into use case analysis. Um, so I'm going to keep moving here. If you want to look those relationships up, feel free. Um, it's basically a high-level diagram to, as I said, ex externally or specify externally perceived behaviors of a system and uses of a system. Um, actors can be human. They might be other systems or equipment, and they could be um, time. Those are pretty much the three basic kinds of actors you can have. Um, and it's debatable whether time is an actor. Uh, I don't want to get into the religious discussion of that, but um, there are some arbitrary viewpoints on that. Uh, a use case represents a, a single use of the system. The box in this diagram um, represents the edges of the system. So in this diagram, the idea here is that you're supposed to represent at least a subset of the use cases inside the what's called the system context, which is this outer uh, boundary box. Um, and you'll notice that none of the interfaces to this box are, are defined really. This is really done at a very high level and is used for uh, analysis, uh, for, for uh, fishing for requirements or trying to analyze what the requirements of the system are. Um, okay, and I talked about those relationships already. This is just another example. Um, this is a representation of the text part of a use case. So one of those ellipses on the previous diagram represents a use case. This is the further fleshing out of that use case. So in this case, um, we're talking about the use case of get paid for car accident. Um, the primary actor is a claimant. The insurance company is the scope, um, you know, and so on. You go down through the, the stakeholders and the preconditions and the minimum guarantees and so forth. Then you get to the main success scenario, which shows the five steps that can that are, are mainly what you're talking about. Then you can extend those those steps in the scenario by labeling with 1A, 1A1, and so on, uh, to show different branches or different flows through the use case. Um, you don't want to let that get too you know crazy, uh, otherwise everything would be in just one use case. But um, it does give you flexibility to um, analyze and document what you've decided about um, particular behaviors. Sequence diagrams. Sequence diagrams are meant to um, focus on sequence of uh, message interchanges to show how um, a particular uh, initiating event gets carried out. So for example, if um, one of the use cases might be to start um, to initiate some kind of a uh, a sequence of events inside a device. So um, the receipt of a uh, command, for example, from, from a, a client device um, might tell you to go to a different mode. So this would show how, for example, an, in, an implementation or a design would accommodate that command, how it would um, achieve that the results for that command. Uh, the parts of a sequence diagram are the frame, the lifelines, the message and occurrence specifications, and uh, an execution specification. And then there's uh, sort of um, an optional piece called interaction operators. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about the reference, um, reference operator in the example. Um, a frame is basically showing what the scope of the diagram is. Uh, lifeline is the different objects that interact. Um, 
typically these are classes or instances and or instances. Um, and the messages and the current specifications, uh, I'll talk about that in the diagram. Um, the execution specification shows when uh, the beginning of processing a particular event begins. And again, I'll show you that on the next page. The reference operator allows you to uh, reference another diagram. And the alternative operator provides sort of an if-else type of functionality. So the idea here is that any sequence diagram is supposed to represent a single uh, execution sequence through something. The one exception to that is if you have an alt or some other kind of um, um, interaction operator that lets you perform things differently. So you might have a case statement, for example. So in this case, you have object one, which is a C1 class of a C1 class. It's an instance of a C1 class. Object three and object four. Um, object two is created on the fly, and you can see that between object three and object four down in, inside that inner box there. So the idea here is that uh, for this sequence diagram, it's kicked off by an opti message, whatever that is. It could be a function call. It could be the receipt of a signal. It could be a number of different things. Uh, in this case, it starts off an execution sequence, which is indicated by the uh, sort of rectangular box down the down object one's uh, lifeline. And uh, it begins to process that. The way it processes it is first it executes an if statement and says, OK, if x is greater than 0, then I'm going to do the, the logic that's above the dotted line. If x is less than or equal to 0, then I'm going to execute the logic that's below the dotted line. So if x is greater than 0, the first thing it does is it creates an object 2, which is a type class 2, on the fly. So it's dynamically creating that. Then the next thing it does is it, it calls a method on that object called foo and passes parameter, which is equal to x. That's the same x that was used in the condition to see if it was greater than 0. So then um, C2's method, foo, does a do it call on object 4. Um, and then uh, do it returns, which is what that dotted line is. And then C2 is destroyed. Uh, the destructor is called, and that object goes away after it returns to object one. And it returns uh, the foo from the foo call. Then it skips all that else logic and then goes and returns to whatever called this sequence diagram in the first place. So it's returning from opti. Similarly, uh, the else condition does, does a similar type of um, uh, flow. So you can see that time is sort of moving down or at least sequence is moving down the diagram. The further down you get, the further along in the sequence you are. Uh, you can also nest these execution sequences, or execution specifications, rather, these, these bars, and they would sort of overlap on each other, be sort of offset and overlap. OK, so I think I went through and explained most of this to you. So this is all, um, this is all sort of documented in those balloons. Next kind of diagram is a communication diagram. Communication diagram's purpose is to do basically the same thing, show sequence and communication between objects. However, the uh, focus is on the structure of how the objects connect together rather than on the sequence of what happens between them. Um, they're used less often, in my opinion. I don't know a whole lot about other, other uses of um, these things, but I, I have tended to use sequence diagrams more often than communication diagrams. Um, in this case, you have an A related to a B related to, uh, which is related to a C. A B is also related to D. See that through the links. And then um, each of the bakas represents a lifeline, but it's not really, there's no line to show because the way communication is done is with these arrows that are labeled. Uh, the one, the one dot one A, the one dot one B shows nested calling of things. So in this case, op1 is called on b, then b's method op1 calls uh, op2 on c, and then calls op3 on d, and then returns uh, from the op1 call to back to a, a's logic. Um, OK, so that's that. State machine diagrams are uh, a method of 
showing states and transitions. Uh, most engineers are familiar with uh, state transition diagrams. Um, this sort of extends uh, state transition diagrams somewhat, and we'll talk about uh, that, but one of the ways it extends it is with orthogonal state processing, uh, and there's a concept in UML called regions. Regions are basically um, asynchronous, or at least parallel, um, units of execution. Um, each region can only have one state active inside of it at any given time, and then states are connected be between, or states are connected with transition uh, symbols. Uh, when a state is entered, there's the opportunity to specify an action that can be executed. Same thing with when it is exited. While you're in that state, you may receive more events which cause you to do do actions. And I'll show you some of that in a minute in the examples. Um, hierarchical organization is allowed in state machines as well. This is another sort of extension to uh, the state transition concept. So you can have sub-state machines or sub-machines. And I'll, again, I'll show you that in the example. Um, so state machine diagrams. Um, okay, so these are this is transitions. So what makes up a transition? There's a source state and a destination state that are connected by the transition. The arrowhead is obviously at the state um, on the states on the destination states side. Um, Transition can have three main components, a trigger event, a guard condition, and an action. The trigger event is what tells the transition, hey, it's time to examine this transition to see if we're going to take it. The guard condition is saying, only take this transition if this condition is true. And the reset, I'm sorry, the, the action uh, portion of the transition statement is um, logic that's executed as you're transitioning. Um, all three of those combined for a very flexible way to do a lot of different kinds of things. So you can transition out of a source state to two different states depending on whether the guard condition is true or not. So you might have one guard condition go to state A as a destination state uh, if tick count is greater than 120, and then another transition, a different transition that goes to state B that has a guard condition that looks exactly like this, except it says tick count is less than or equal to 120. Okay, states. Um, as I said before, a state can have an entry, a do activity, and uh, an exit um, behavior. So three, the three different types of behavior, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, the do behavior, the entry behavior, and the exit behavior are three uh, opportunities to attach behavior to um, sort of a point in the process when you're entering the state, exiting the state, or are in the state receiving events. The triggers are the events that can be received um, that allow you to either do a do activity or to exit the state. Uh, I take that back, not exit the state, uh, that allow you to do the do activity. To exit the state, um, the trigger that would, have, would affect exiting the state is attached to another transition that's outside the state. That's why I corrected myself. States have names, too. That's another um, thing I wanted to point out. And the idea here is that a state models some kind of invariant condition. So you're in configuration mode. You're um, waiting for something. You're um, processing something. Um, Okay, so transitions. So transitions have, a sort, as I said, source and target state, and they have the uh, event trigger. They have a guard condition, and they have effects, which is basically the action that executes when, um, when the trigger is taken. I mean, sorry, when the transition is taken. Um, there's sort of this idea of run to completion. Basically, the events are modeled as queued, and each event is dequeued one at a time, and then each dequeued event is processed all the way through. So in other words, you don't start processing an event and then start processing the next event before the event processing for the first one is done. 
this simplifies uh, understanding of the state machine as well as uh, reducing the complexity of it so that um, you avoid quality issues. This does not preclude asynchronous execution. Um, so you can, you can design in asynchronous execution. It's just you would use those regions to do that. OK, um, what are some of the element types that can go into um, a state machine diagram? There's an initial state, which is the black dot there. That says where you start once you enter that state, where you start the state logic. Uh, and simple states versus uh, compound states. So S is a state, but it's a compound state. It, it has states within it. Um, and transitions. So the transitions, as we said before, have the three different components, and they connect the states in, in the uh, state machine. Uh, I think I covered all this. The aborted, uh, these, these um, circles on the outside of a sub submachine state indicate they're sort of like ports, like where, except they have to do with execution flow as opposed to uh, information flow. So in this case, if you have a read amount submachine, um, it looks like the only way that you can leave this state is through the aborted uh, port. So it's basically labeling that, um, I don't think they're called ports. I don't remember what they're called. We'll, we'll find out in two more slides, I think. Um, but basically, it's a, it's a way to identify how you're leaving that state or entering the state. Um, other types of elements that can go on a, a state machine diagrams are decision diamonds, um, actions, and um, state lists. OK, submachines, um, as I said before, can sort of help um, define hierarchy. So you can reference a submachine with simply a name. And then you can go to another diagram and see what the contents of that submachine are. So it's a way to uh, sort of make diagrams more manageable and show hierarchy and, and modularization, if you will. Again, these are entry points and exit points on the submachine states. So here's an example of a submachine. You have an entry one, you come into some kind of a state, and then you take, if you get a transition A event, you would leave through the exit A uh, point. If you get a transition B event, that would cause you to leave through the exit B exit point. This is another example, obviously done by a different tool, and shows how guard conditions are used. So you would stay in a starting state, the dot at the top, the red dot at the top, um, until the start condition becomes true. So start might be a variable in your software program, or it could be some other mechanism in a different type of model. Uh, you would enter the simulator running state until stop became true. Um, once you're in simulator running, start no longer matters. Start could go back to false, and it wouldn't matter. You've already entered the simulator running state, and you're, you're on your way. Um, at the, in the middle and at the bottom, you can see that there is a, uh, a do um, method or uh, action that's, that's um, specified. Behavior, that's the word I was looking for, sorry. And um, what you do while you're in the simulator pause state is to wait. Wait would be some kind of logic that would specify what you're doing while you're waiting. Then if pause, if unpause happens, you go back to simulator running. If data request, if data requested condition becomes true, you would go to the log retrieval, you'd output the log, and then if continue is true, you'd go back to simulator running. If continue is not true, then you would end. OK, so how you use regions is with uh, uh, fork and join elements. You can see that there's a state that contains two regions. One is the S region. One is, has an S state, and one has a Q state. Uh, and you arrive in those states, which are active at the same time, um, by entering the fork bar on the left. The join um, 
notation works in such a way that S, you have to exit S and you have to exit Q in order to continue on. So if, if the transition indicated after the S there uh, gets fired, you would get to the bar basically, but you would not continue on until the transition connecting the Q and the bar execute or fire. So here's a, another example. You would start at the uh, black dot at the top in course attempt, uh, and you would enter studying. And um, I don't know if that's a good label for that that um, state, but basically it's why you're in in the course. Um, so your first your first region says you have to pass lab one, and then pass lab two, and then you're done. The three black dots on the right are termination black dots, and they terminate the region. You can also terminate a state diagram with those. Um, and basically, because they're regions, once all three of those reach termination, then you would go to pass. You'd, you'd go to the past state. Uh, the second region has a term project, and when the project is done, you'd go to the termination of that region. And then you would take your final test. Not, not then. These are all shown in parallel, which, again, is debatable. Uh, with respect to um, um, whether it matches reality accurately or not. But if, if you fail the final test, you go to the failed state. If you pass the final test, you go to the passed state. I think you get the idea from the example, even though it's not a great example. Here's an example of a traffic light. Um, so if power ever goes off, you go to the off state. If power goes back on again, you, you reset a timer while you're transitioning to the red state. So when power comes back on, this shows that when power comes back on, or when power is powered on, you always go to the red state. Then um, there's a condition that says you wait, um, you wait 120 seconds, and then you go to green. Then you wait 10 seconds, and you go to yellow. Then you wait 120 seconds, and you go to red. Uh, obviously, changing the, the time durations on those would, would change the way the light operates. Okay, activity diagrams. Uh, I believe this is the last diagram we're going to examine. And basically, this is a flowchart on steroids. It, it extends the flowchart idea like the state machine uh, extends the state transition diagram idea. Um, and basically, its purpose is to allow you, you to organize behaviors and add control logic of your own through branching, loop, looping, selection, and so on. Um, you can, again, specify concurrent behaviors with regions, and um, you can uh, receive and handle asynchronous events from outside um, sources. And you can also fire events to other outside sources. So uh, again, there's a hierarchical representation, so you can modularize your logic. So here's an example of an activity diagram. Um, there's um, uh, I, I'm, I mistakenly mentioned regions before. No regions here. The fork and the join uh, allow you to uh, do parallel activities. So uh, the box on the left, on the, the, the largest box on here, is uh, a box encapsulating the activity called process order. Uh, the smaller box on the, on the edge of that, called requested order, is basically the input um, to the activity, and it um, passes data to receive order. Receive order um, does something. Um, the diamond to the right of receive order is like an if statement. So if the order is rejected, you go straight to the end diamond, and then merge that um, decision diamond into the final um, flow, and you would close the order ending up at the activity final node. If the order is accepted, you would try to fill the order. So you would fork into two separate parallel paths, one where you ship the order and one where you uh, send an invoice, uh, payment is made, payment's accepted. Once all that is done, you can join and close the order. And that is...
an introduction to UML. I hope you've uh, gotten something out of this. Um, the PowerPoint slides for this presentation will be on Exeter's website. So go to exeter.com to uh, review this again.